Well, hello everyone. Cynthia Tomain here with Interactive Brokers, and thank you for joining us today um, for today's webinar presentation on what the Fed has been watching while you were at the beach over the summer. I'm very pleased to have with me Adam Johnson, and we're actually sitting side by side here. So uh, if you do have any questions for either me or for Adam, make sure that you enter those into the questions panel, and we will be addressing them before we do part company here today. So with that, I'd like to bring Adam on board, and let me actually, uh, I'm going to pass the controls over to Adam so that he can uh, start off, and let's get going with today's presentation. So Adam, I'm going to move this over to uh, <clears throat> your control here. And That's a scary, scary concept, Cynthia. <laughs> well, let me see here. Okay. Um, let me, wait a minute. Make present. Oh, here we go. I have to select yes. Okay, now, <laughs> now we have these controls. Um, all right. So with that, um, we're now putting this over onto Adam's slides. Adam, could you start by telling us a little bit of your background and what brought you here? <laughs> well, uh, thankfully, you actually you're one of the people who brought me here. So I have to say thank you, first of all, Cynthia, to you and to uh, Interactive Brokers. Um, what a what a what an honor to be. Um, associated with uh, such a, an outstanding brand. So I was a Bloomberg anchor for a number of years through the financial crisis. Um, prior to that, I was a trader. And um, I had no life as an anchor, Cynthia. I got up at 3 every morning uh, because I was doing the morning show. And I, was, I kind of had an itch to start my own business. So I decided to basically combine my my life's work of right uh, trading, um, analyzing companies, and then presenting or talking about companies uh, under one roof, and that's Bullseye Brief. So Bullseye Brief is my investment letter. I publish um, three actionable stock ideas every two weeks. And then on the off weeks, I put out a Sunday night kind of roadmap for the week ahead, as well as a podcast. So um, thank you for, for inviting me to come on today. You know, it's amazing, Cynthia. I remember when you and I first sort of talked about doing this back in July, and September seems so far away, and here we are. Oh, yes, here we are. Well, let's get um, underway. And by the way, everyone, Bullseye Brief is also now available through the Interactive Brokers trading platform, Trader Workstation. And before we end today's session, I'll also show you how you can access uh, <clears throat> uh, to view some additional information and even get a sample report. So with that, let's go ahead and take it away, Adam. Let's okay. get underway. Well, thank you, Cynthia. So first, I just want to give you a sense for where we are headed today, and there are really three topics I would like to, uh, to address, and Cynthia, of course, is going to help me get from point A to point B, so that we're going to go from my nice uh, photo of the beach, which I took in the Bahamas about a year ago, to uh, right here, our three topics. Number one, what has changed? Number two, three scenarios we're going to talk through. And then uh, finally, uh, point number three, um, have we been here before? And I will tell you the answer is yes. So first of all, as far as what has changed, we're going to talk about um, economic data, because that can certainly change considerably. The Fed messaging has changed. We're going to go through um, uh, how and why. And then, of course, what some of the other central banks have been telling us. Remember, there's a cabal out there. All these central banks are working together. They swelled the balance sheets to uh, step in and buy bonds back in 08 and 09 when the private sector wouldn't. And then, of course, they kept buying them. So um, they're in this together, and uh, we're obviously in this with them. So. Um, we will talk about uh, central banks around the world as well. And then I want to lay out the three scenarios. The Fed is meeting today. I should say the FOMC is meeting today. They're meeting again tomorrow. And at 2 p.m., we will get their communique, which says, here's what we're going to do on interest rates, point number one. And um, here's what we're going to do to shrink the size of the balance sheet. That's point number two. And that's really what everyone is focused on right now. We know rates are going up, but they're not going up that much. The real issue is how are they going to shrink this gigundo 4.5 trillion dollar balance sheet. There are three scenarios, and we're going to talk through each of them. Calm seas, no hike, no taper. I give that about a 20% shot. Gentle breeze, I think that's where we're headed, which is uh, rates are going to be steady, and they're going to offer a uh, plan to taper. And that plan, in theory, will take effect in October. Again, we'll find out the details tomorrow. But I think that is most likely where we're headed. I'm going to assign a 70% probability to that. And then finally, surfs up, um, where they would give us um, a plan for rates um, that is aggressive and a, a plan for buying 
or I should say uh, shrinking the balance sheet, which is also aggressive. I don't think we're headed there. I'm going to give that only uh, about a 10% shot. But, uh, you know, this is a gradualist Fed, Cynthia. So um, we're going we're gonna to take it in stride. And then finally, uh, point number three, have we been here before? Yes, but no. Or you could say no, but yes. Um, previous rate height examples and uh, some of the lessons learned. So with that, let's jump into it. And I thought we'd start off with um, how we feel because, um, you know, we are um, – we are, uh, we are physical people, right? We're, we're, we're beasts. We have emotions. Um, we have animal spirits. And I think how we feel is very important. I think it guides uh, a lot of our decision-making. For better or worse, it's just reality. And the fact is, we feel pretty good these days. According to Gallup, we feel the best we have felt about the economy since 2001. In other words, that's a 16-year high looking at this data. And how curious, by the way, that um, uh, not only do... Um, uh, do we feel the best in 16 years, but we have the best employment uh, in 16 years. So uh, as we work, as we make money, we have money to spend, support our families, etc., uh, we also feel pretty good about uh, our investments. And um, it's sort of a, a curious uh, uh, coincident indicator. And I should just point out, by the way, that this data was um, based upon a survey that happened at the tail end of January, or excuse me, tail end of July, early August. Uh, it was uh, Wells Fargo and Gallup working together, and it was, you know, real people with real money in the game, uh, investors with $10,000 or more invested in stock, bonds, mutual funds. So we feel pretty good. And then the question is, why do we feel good? Well, let me show you. If we actually look at the, uh, the data itself, as you can see, based upon these um, six data points, things are getting better versus last year. Unemployment at 4.4% versus 4.9%. Um, hourly wages are getting better. Average home prices are getting better. Uh, real GDP growth getting better. Inflation, yes, we actually want to see inflation, right? That's the Fed's whole thing, and there hasn't been enough uh, because deflation is the enemy. Um, well, we're actually starting to see more inflation in spite of my, what you might read, you know, on the front of various newspapers. And look at that, earnings growth. That is so powerful. In fact, I've been arguing that the market has been propelled by what I call the two E's, earnings growth of 9.6, call it 10%, and employment, the, again, the um, highest percentage of Americans working in 16 years. Uh, earnings and employment, the two E's, this is a very powerful tonic for stocks. It has been my guiding principle and why I have been uh, long stocks, and um, not just long the market, but picking the stocks. That's what I do at Bullseye. I try to pick stocks. As a matter of fact, through June 30th, my picks were up on average. There were 35 of them, um, just over 20%, beating the S&P by about twofold. So it's not that I just want to own the market, but I want to try to, if I'm comfortable with the market, I then want to try to find companies that are growing faster than the market. So the two E's, that's the macro backdrop. We have been feeling better. And something I think I should point out, Cynthia, when I was in college, my, um, my Econ 101 prof was Alan Blinder, the former vice chairman of the Fed. And he told me that full employment was um, 6%, that we could almost never go below that. And he said at 5%, you run the risk of huge inflation. Here we are at 4 point, you know, 4%. So it's just amazing how the world has changed. Um, so um, by the way, as Cynthia mentioned, um, we'll be taking questions at, at the end. But you know what? If there's some question that comes to mind and you simply have to ask it, um, please do, and maybe we'll even fit it into the uh, into the conversation. All right, so um, economic growth clearly getting better, um, but let's be honest, growth is never a straight line. Nothing in life is a straight line. Um, and what I'm showing you now is the City Economic Surprise Index. This is a fascinating index. Um, the way it works, by the way, is for every data point that comes out, um, inflation, employment, uh, uh, personal expenditures, you, you pick a data point, the city follows it. If the data comes out better, they assign plus one. If it comes out worse, they assign minus one. And then they just keep a running tally. And you can see that we had that soft patch um, in March and April. That was largely because we had the, um, the slowdown in the middle of the first quarter, January, February, March, and then by the time all that data actually percolated to the surface and got reported, it was, uh, you know, March, April, May. 
That was that soft patch, and it kind of concerned the Fed. And all of a sudden, you heard uh, Ms. Yellen, um, the chairman of the Fed, um, and the various um, Fed governors um, kind of softening their stance on getting rates back to normal. At that point, the Fed fund futures suggested that we would have four rate hikes this year. Um, we have had two, and there is, believe it or not, even some debate as to whether we'll have the third. Again, if you go back to the beginning of the year, everyone was certain we'd have four. So, you know, the fact that life is not a straight line, data is not a straight line, means that these things do change. So, um, the good news is, as you can see, the um, surprises have resumed to the positive side. So, we are now trending a higher. We're not yet back to a zero. As you can see, latest data is a negative 16, but we're certainly moving um, the right direction. And by the way, I just want to add there is a caveat, and that is the impact of Hurricanes uh, Harvey and Irma. I should point out that as far as um, the jobs survey is concerned, that occurs on the week of the month, every month, um, which uh, captures the 12th day of the month. And just because of the way the hurricanes came in, um, actually, they missed that particular week. So as uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics is calling around to people and try to gather data for the survey, um, it wasn't actually during the hurricane. So, you know, I could actually make an argument either way that you're not going to see the data, the hurricane data, in some of the um, uh, jobs numbers or that there will be some sort of lag. As far as GDP is concerned, um, you're not going to necessarily see a downtick for a month or two, but again, this is that kind of mushy part of economics. It's not science. You could also make the case, based upon what we've seen in previous hurricanes like Katrina in 05, that um, it, was, it was actually stimulative because you had so much rebuilding that occurred. So stay tuned on that. What we know for now is the data is moving the right direction. So let's look at what Ms. Yellen has been saying. And there's sort of three components to that, rates near-term, longer-term, and tapering Fed assets. Let's just start with that first paragraph. And again, these are her actual words from various speeches she gave in July, and I quote, because inflation is currently quite low by historical standards, the federal funds rate would not have to rise all that much further to get to a neutral policy stance. All right, let's just clarify what she means by that. First of all, inflation, whether you want to look at CPI, which is running 1.9%, or whether you want to look at um, uh, the PCE, which is running about 1.4%, uh, both of those are indicators the Fed watches. Um, but the average would be, you know, call it 1.6 or so. Um, they want to get it to 2. And right now with Fed funds, the upper bound at 1.25%, 1.25 is only um, 35 or 40 basis points below that kind of 1.6 average, and that's your point. Inflation is currently quite low, so the Fed funds at 1.25% wouldn't have to rise all that much to just get us to neutral. What she's really doing here is, is telegraphing the fact that while rates are going up, they're probably not going up a lot. And back to that point I just mentioned about how at the beginning of the year we thought there'd be four hikes and we've only had two, and now Fed fund futures are saying there's only about a 50% chance that we'll get another one in December. Um, this is why, because she's saying, you know, inflation hasn't really surfaced the way we had thought, the way we hoped. It's, it's coming along, but, you know, it's still well below two, so we don't have to move all that much. That's the near term. So tomorrow, by the way, we're probably not going to get um, a particularly uh, bullish rates commentary. It'll be, you know, it's kind of moving, but it's not moving a lot, so we're going gradual. That's been her pattern. Longer term, she reflected, quote, Gradual rate hikes will happen over the next few years. Again, she's a gradualist. She's telling us this. She has been telling us this, and as long as she is the Fed chair, she is likely to continue telling us this. Remember, her term doesn't expire until February, so she's certainly with us through the new year. Um, and it, we can have a separate conversation about will she be renominated or not. That's not necessarily relevant to this story uh, in this moment. Uh, the day before her announcement. But the point is, um, given Mr. Trump's um, background as a real estate developer where low rates are generally preferable, I could imagine, a, uh, even if she's not the new Fed chair that he nominates, I could imagine a similar viewpoint. So I think that gradual um, approach is something that we're going to continue to see regardless of who the Fed chair is. So longer term rates, gradual rate hikes, 
over the next few years. And then finally, tapering assets. This is what really everyone wants. This is the meat of the thing. Quote, we've been trying very carefully, yes, she has been, to lay out our plans to reduce the size of the balance sheet. So um, there's a lot that we can say about that, but uh, before I just get into the plan about how they're going to reduce the balance sheet, I just want to let you know um, where the other members of the Federal Open Market Committee are, um, are poised. And Cynthia, if we can... Uh find the dot plot, which is uh, such a, I think it's kind of funny that the dot plot is hiding from us, that the dot plot doesn't want to come up because, um, you know, dot plots are kind of quirky to begin with. Oh, are we not able to show the dot plot? Maybe not. It's, uh, it's page number seven. Yeah. Ah, thank goodness. Sorry about that. No problem. Um, uh, what is a dot plot? This is a quirky little Bloomberg screen that um, I downloaded. And uh, remember, there are 19 members of the Fed. It's not just the chair, Chair Yellen. Um, she has 18 other partners in crime, so to speak. And the dot plot effectively creates a dot for all 19 members so that you can sort of get a sense for how they feel collectively. We don't know which dot is hers or which dot is anybody else's, but at least we see all the dots. And you can see right there for 2017, all the dots are concentrated right about where we are, 1.25%. That's the upper bound for currently where Fed funds are. Remember, we've had four rate hikes since they started hiking. The lowest we got was 25 basis points. So, you know, we're already embarking on the path. So for 2017, you can see only four dots, meaning four members of the FOMC, think we're going to go higher um, in December. Fed fund futures right now are at about 54%. So actually, the market is, is more hawkish on rates than the Fed itself, which is sort of interesting. Uh, but this could get updated tomorrow uh, at 2 p.m. Looking after 2018, um, if we just go with where the Fed is, about 225, so that's like three hikes for 2018, and then about another three hikes, uh, which gets us close to 3% for uh, 2019. So that would be kind of a, a nifty, wouldn't it? If we get one in December, that would be three this year, then we get three in 18, three in 19. When I tell you the Fed's gradual, that's exactly what I'm talking about. There are no surprises here. All right. So if we um, shift to the next chart, I put this in because I thought some of you might be falling asleep after all those dots. Um, it's kind of a fun chart that um, I just find fascinating. Uh, this was put together by the team at what I learned uh, this week. Uh, that's the Twitter handle. I, 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 I urge you to uh, go sign up for their tweets because it's insightful stuff like this. This is a pattern of uh, the world economy going all the way back to the year one, right? Uh, and then you see the year 1000, obviously they compressed time. And then it comes up through 2017. I said, why the Fed still matters? Um, the U.S. is still number one. I mean, if you go back to the year one, isn't it amazing how significant China has been to the world economy? Um, and then in the 50s, 60s, post-World War II, China, you know, shrunk. Um, and uh, the U.S. still very big. Uh, Amazing, though, as you look at um, uh, Japan and India, I mean, the amount of money on, on, on the other side of the world um, and how that powers the global economy is staggering. But that said, the U.S. is still number one. So that's why we care about the Fed. Um, it's, uh, you know, what they say is, is ultimately driving the bus. The U.S. economy is the largest economy in the world, um, uh, accounting for... Uh, you know, almost 20% of world uh, GDP. So the Fed matters, all right? So uh, i tell you what, let's now uh, move forward to our, our three scenarios. And since uh, we're talking about what the Fed was watching while we're at the beach, I just want to stay with kind of a little uh, beachy theme here. Calm seas, gentle breeze, and surf's up. And obviously in the calm seas scenario, it's, um, it's not that big a change. Um, whereas gentle breezes, which is I think what we're going to get tomorrow, um, the Fed's starting to move us along and then finally surfs up. I don't think we'll get that, but we just have to address it in case we do. So under the calm seas, and we'll give this, you know, maybe a 20% shot. No more hikes this year. Again, Fed Fund Futures are giving this one a 54% odd uh, of happening. Um, uh, and my guess is that uh, they will mention the hurricane impact because Chair Yellen has made very clear that uh, this is a data-driven Fed, and she's going to have to acknowledge that. Uh, meanwhile, as we look at the balance sheet, because again, it's not just raising rates, it's also raising rates, and what are we going to do to shrink the balance sheet? <clears throat> but under the Calm C scenario, a taper plan will be announced tomorrow. 
uh, but the plan will not be activated or acted upon for another um, couple of months. Again, gradual is fed. Call it mid, uh, mid, you know, 4Q. I would give again this this calm sea scenario 20% shot, um, and and uh, I think what we will get though tomorrow is a little bit of a gentle breeze blowing in, uh, courtesy of the Federal Reserve. I think the Fed is going to telegraph one more hike for December. Um, I also think that uh, they're going to maintain that guidance of two to three hikes for 2018. Um, she has been very consistent in how uh, she has um, uh, maintained that uh, viewpoint. And um, uh, the dot plot uh, currently implies only two hikes for uh, 2018. So this is all very much in line with what's already out there, this gentle breeze. It's not like there are any surprises here. The gentle breeze feels good, as it should. Um, especially uh, as humid as the city has been the past couple of days. Looking at the balance sheet, we'll get a taper plan. This is largely expected. Um, it will uh, most likely begin in October, and um, uh, it's going to start small but rise over time. And I just want to um, sort of pause on that concept for a moment, because we've already gotten some indications from the Federal Reserve that um, the taper is going to work as follows. And again, we'll get the details tomorrow at 2 o'clock when they actually issue the press uh, statement. And that's why we're having this, uh, this, this, this webinar today. So we're not surprised when we see this. But tomorrow, expect that they will say the taper plan will begin as of October and that it will start at $10 billion per month, meaning that as the current bonds on the balance sheet, of which there are $4.5 trillion, as the current bonds start to expire, they will not be reinvested, as they have been for the past um, number of years, but instead they'll be retired. And bonds will be retired at a rate, initially, of $10 billion per month. If, by the way, more than $10 billion worth of bonds retire in any given month, they will reinvest the proceeds. Okay? So they'll retire $10 billion initially, even if $20 billion um, come due. Over the next several months, that $10 billion will actually rise to $50 billion a month. And what they telegraphed initially was that they'll do so, they'll move from 10 to 20 to 30 to 40 to 50 on a quarterly basis. So in other words, if they start the taper in October, for October, November, and December, they'll effectively uh, retire $10 billion worth of bonds uh, each of the three months for a total of $30 billion. By the time we get to Q1, the number will raise to 20. So then in Q1, it'll be 20, 20, 20 for a total of 60. Then by the time we get to Q3, they'll raise it to 30. So um, as we get to Q3, it'll be 30. You see how this works? So they're, again, gradual. I cannot say the word gradual enough. Um, that is what they have already telegraphed. So we sort of know what's going to happen tomorrow. It's just a question of timing and whether they tweak it at the margin. And by, by the way, I should point out, remember, the Fed has been buying both um, uh, treasuries as well as mortgage-backed bonds. The mortgage-backed bonds, MBS, those are the ones that were really bad uh, and where the Fed had to create a bid. You go back to 08, 09, I mean, at one point, the, the Fed was like 90% of the underlying bids in the market for mortgage-backed securities. No one wanted to buy them. And that's why we had to have Q1, Q2, Q3. Uh, and uh, I mean, it was like QE forever. But uh, you know, we got through that. The market's healthy, and now the Fed is scaling back and removing itself as that dominant buyer because private buyers have stepped back in. So this all should be happening. Some would argue, like Robert Kaplan, who was actually president of the Dallas Fed, that it should have happened a long time ago. Um, Richard Fisher, his predecessor, said the same thing. But you know, nonetheless, these things take time. You, you know, the wheels of government sometimes they turn slowly. Uh, especially where public policy is concerned. And you know what? Maybe it's just as well so that we're not rash. Um, and talk about rash, I just have to acknowledge the 10% probability that serves up tomorrow. I don't think we'll get this, but we have to acknowledge it as a possibility. And that is a clear indication of, of a Q4 rate hike. I don't think there'll be a clear indication. She'll say, we might. Um, and um, opening the door to a second rate hike, I mean, no way. But it's possible, you know, it's, again, you know, you never know if the surf suddenly comes up. She's a gradualist, but you never know if they telegraph two more hikes. Um, and then guiding specifically to three hikes for 2018. Um, guiding to three hikes is very specific, and she generally, uh, Chair Yellen, likes to uh, give herself a little bit of wiggle room, which, you know, is smart because, as we pointed out earlier, data is never a straight line. 
looking at the balance sheet, um, the taper plan would be announced. They would say it's effective immediately, and it's a straight line. In other words, we're not going um, uh, 10 billion in the first uh, quarter up to 20 billion in the second quarter. It, it's, they're just going to come out with a number and do it. Again, that is not what they have said they will do, but we have to acknowledge that you just never know. I would assign the SERS up scenario only about a 10% um, probability. So again, column C is 20%, general breeze 70%. That's, I think, what we'll get. And then finally, uh, bless you, Cynthia, uh, surfs up, uh, just 10%. All right, so uh, moving forward, um, I just want to underscore the fact that, I mean, we have never been here before. And that's why we're having this webinar today. I mean, there is some crazy stuff that has been happening behind the scenes. You probably already know it if you're an investor and in the markets, but a four and a half trillion dollar balance sheet at the Federal Reserve. I took this chart back about uh, you know 20 years, called 1995, and you can see we've never come anywhere close. And not only has it been the Federal Reserve buying, it's been the Bank of Japan and the European Central Bank as well. Comparable numbers, all about five trillion. Um, I didn't even have room to throw in the Bank of England and various other uh, central banks that have been part of this. I hesitate to use the word cabal, but I'm going to use it anyway, because um, they're all in this thing together. And, you know, there was a time, quite frankly, for any of you out there who think that, you know, the Fed has way overstepped its bounds, and uh, fair viewpoint, maybe they've stayed too long. I already told you that, you know, several of the Fed governors thought they overstayed their bounds. But there was a time, if you remember back in 08 or 09, uh, there was no bid. I mean, the Fed had to do something. It literally... Hats off to the Fed. I mean, they, they saved the financial system. They really did. Um, you know, we can, various presidents, um, every single one of them, uh, likes to always take credit for jobs created under uh, his administration. Uh, maybe one day I'll say his or her administration, but for now it's just his administration. Anyway, it's not the president who creates jobs. It's American businesses who create jobs. And part of what enables American business to create jobs is stability of the financial system. And for that, I really do have to credit the Fed. Um, the Fed stepped in and, and, and bought bonds when nobody else would. They uh, provided that confidence, that floor into the markets. Um, okay, maybe they stuck around too long, but they kind of know it, and that's why they're getting out. All right, so that's your context. We've never been here before, and um, uh, hopefully we'll never have to uh, go through uh, 2008 again. At the end of the day, we are all investors, and we um, deploy capital into the markets, whether that's by buying stocks, bonds, combinations thereof. Hopefully, we all have our 401k accounts, and we maximize them. And if we have, by the way, dividend-paying uh, stocks, we reinvest the dividends. That's just a little plug for doing the right thing in your 401k um, or, or you know, any kind of savings account. Um, but the question is, um, can stocks rally as rates rise? And the answer is yes. I went back. And this is kind of a quirky chart, so let me just talk you through it. But in orange, you see the S&P 500 index. Um, just over time, I went back to 1988. Actually, part of that's 87. Um, and then the Fed funds rate, which is, you know, what we're talking about, that's the rate that the Fed moves around. You can see right now it's 1.25%. And then I highlighted in green the times um, when the Fed was raising rates. And starting back in 88, you can see they raised them significantly. Um, you know, from call it uh, six and a quarter percent up to, you know, practically nine percent. Um, and look at what happened with stocks. Okay, they didn't move all that much, but they did rise. And then you fast forward to 94, same story. Uh, the Fed yanked rates up very high, nothing gradual about that move. Um, and the stocks, okay, they were kind of sideways, but at least you didn't lose money. Um, in 99, Fed raised rates a little bit, you know, call it from uh, five to a little over six. Stocks rallied. All right. In fact, you got a pretty big move in percentage terms. The S&P went from probably 1,200 to 1,500. I mean, that works. That's 25 percent. Hello. Um, and look at 04, 05, 06. Again, Fed yank rates hard for a long time, and uh, stocks rallied and continued to rally. Um, and then finally, we had 08. So my point is, as you look at where we are now, um, we've gone from uh, zero to uh, 125. And stocks have rallied thus far. They can keep rallying. Um, that's very important to realize. This, this, this rate move by the Fed is not necessarily something to fear. And um, I can't underscore that enough because um, 
one of the other questions that um, you know a skeptic would certainly want to ask is, do higher rates necessarily lead to recessions? And um, the immediate answer is no, but it is, I will admit, a little more complicated than that. Now, if you're looking at this chart and saying, what in the world is this? Let me just explain. I have a Fed funds rate in white, and I have used um, sort of gray dashed lines to um, show you where we had recessions. <clears throat> You can see there was a recession back in 1991, again in 01, and then obviously 0809. And I've highlighted in, um, with you know, green arrows, when the Fed was raising rates. You know, the same chart as what we saw before. It's just, you know, I, did, I took the S&P out because it would be too crowded. And you can see, um, yeah, you do eventually get recessions, but it's not like there's cause and effect here. So back in 90, for example, they started raising rates. Well, we went for, you know, two and a half years before the start of a rate hike, before there was a recession. In 93, they raised uh, rates, and there was no recession immediately. Um, in 99, right, the tech bubble, they started raising rates, and again, you were good for two years, and then, you know, back in uh, 03, 04, look at that. You had a good run for three and a half years after the Fed started raising rates. So at this point, we're two years in. If you take an average of that, you know, those examples, I know there are only four there, but um, the average is like three years, and we're only two years in, right? So just purely based on that very limited uh, data set, we would have another year before it really even sort of becomes the average. And look how much lower rates are now than they ever were before, all right? So um, if you're fearful of the Fed raising rates, I've just showed you that you shouldn't be because stocks can continue to rally. And point number two, this chart, that you're not going to necessarily have an, a recession anyway. So do not be afraid of the Fed. Uh, embrace the Fed. The Fed is, is doing the right thing. The Fed is getting us back to normal, all right? Um, and with that, I want to just sort of bring it all together because it's, it's important that we, we recognize what's happening here. Um, so what has changed? Um, well, we've had clearly improvement from that soft patch in the first quarter. Uh, the second quarter and third quarter, very clearly the data has come back. Uh, our confidence is the highest um, we have seen in 16 years. Employment is the best it has been in 16 years. Inflation, thank goodness, is starting to percolate. In other words, there is a lot to like in the markets right now. Um, uh, but again, the Fed has to reiterate this gradualist approach. The Fed has been gradual, it is telegraphing that it's uh, currently gradual, and it um, will likely telegraph tomorrow at 2 p.m. that it's going to maintain its gradualist approach. And by the way, that's exactly what we want. Markets hate surprises. So the Fed is just letting us know it's got our back. It's no longer going to, you know, pump our arms full of um, IV fluid, but if for some crazy reason we needed that, it would be there to... Um, support us. And that, by the way, is a very interesting point. Um, the Fed has also made clear that while it intends to taper and start reducing the balance sheet, if for some reason there were events um, whereby it needed to come back in and um, purchase assets and therefore make the balance sheet big again, it would do so. And we know that because that's exactly what Chair Yellen told us back in July when she testified in front of Congress. Again, there are no surprises here, all right? And I, that, that, that's what we all need to embrace and just recognize. Um, Today we're just trying to uh, uh, sharpen our pencils so that we know what to expect tomorrow. Um, now, I should also point out what's changed, the ECB. The ECB was saying initially that it was going to be very aggressive. Mario Draghi, the president of the European Central Bank, had said back in May that he was um, uh, keen to uh, do the same thing that Chair Yellen was doing, reduce the size of the European uh, Central Bank balance sheet. But he's kind of scaled that back, and the market's like that. So. Um, uh, what has changed? Uh, data's gotten better. Um, the European Central Bank has also said, yeah, you know, we're here. We're not going to be aggressive. We're gradualist. Um, and uh, that jives with the Fed saying we're gradualist. The three scenarios, as you just saw, calm seas. Um, if you look at Fed fund futures, there's only a 54% chance of a D's rate hike, a D's for December, three traders out there. Um, 
So, um, you know, there is certainly that possibility out there that it's going to be very gradual. But again, I assign only a 20% chance of that. Uh, general breezes, this is what I'm going with, and that's based upon the dot plot where we're going to get um, most likely uh, three rate hikes next year. And because of what Chair Yellen told us in June, we're going to get a very clearly um, uh, delineated plan to decrease the size of the balance sheet. Again, tomorrow at 2 p.m., you should be in front of your... Uh, well, wherever you are, whether it's a, uh, your interactive broker screens, your Bloomberg terminal, or certainly uh, getting news alerts on your iPhone, because there'll be plenty of them. Um, and uh, finally, that 10% that chance of the surf being up. Um, and I say that is uh, very unlikely unless we get some sort of major policy pivot at the Fed. There's no reason to think we'll get it, but I'll just acknowledge that there's a 10% chance, because you just never know. Um, have we been here before, as we've shown you? Uh, yes and no. Yes, we have seen. Uh, times when uh, the Fed has hiked rates, in some cases even noticeably, um, and uh, it has not impacted um, uh, negatively. It has not impacted either stocks or the economy. Um, that's the good news. Uh, but no, we've kind of not been here before because we've never had a balance sheet that is this large. So, you know, there, there's still some uncertainties out there just because of the magnitude of this thing. 4.5 trillion, and not only is it the Fed balance sheet that's 4.5 trillion, but as I showed you earlier, it's all these other central banks as well. And um, uh, the balance sheet, it, it's, you know, it's going to create unprecedented challenge, um, but they're laying out a very uh, sane plan. And uh, again, I just want to point out, stocks can continue to rally as rates rise. Focus on the two E's, earnings and employment. That has been uh, my whole story. I think it's the guiding force behind markets. There's still value plays out there, and I've talked about them in Bullseye from Macy's, where you're basically buying the business for the value of the real estate and getting the retail for free, or say a Haynes Celestial, which had to restate its uh, financials, got punished by 20%, and now all of a sudden um, activist investors are coming in to buy it. Then there are the uh, growth uh, drivers like the shift to electronic vehicles um, and the various ways that, uh, say, a Ford is playing on that, or a Delphi creating the spinoff for the new uh, uh, parts components. Uh, uh, there are so many different angles in this market. It's about stock picking. It's not about blindly indexing yourself. And as a matter of fact, I've even written about that in Bullseye, the fact that uh, a Coca-Cola with shrinking earnings would uh, trade at 25 times um, uh, earnings, the same uh, uh, multiple that, for example, Boeing trades at. I just find that incredibly ironic. And it tells me that some of us have probably fallen asleep at the switch and we're not um, following all those names that are buried in our brokerage statements that we might have inherited or that might be part of a 401k. My point is, um, now's the time for stock picking. Listen to the Fed. Appreciate what they're telling us. Recognize where we are in the market. Recognize we can, can continue to rally. And un understand the stocks that you're long. Know them. Embrace them. And uh, with that, I would like to open the uh, floor to questions. If okay. Well, I'd like to remind everyone there is a, <clears throat> a questions title bar where you can submit questions to Adam so that he, so that he can uh, respond to them. And I see several lengthy questions coming in, so I'm going to give him a break. Um, and what I would like to do at this point, we'll come back to your questions in just a moment. What I would like to do, I'm going to take um, the platform or bring up our website so that you can find uh, <clears throat> via interactive brokers where you can find out more, even get a sampled report from Bullseye Brief. Now, notice I brought up our homepage, and I do want to take you, first of all, to our <clears throat> Uh, notice here, our pricing menu is probably the easiest way to find it. You'll find, uh, notice here, there is research news and market data, and that will take you to a spot where you can access any of the products that we do have. Now, notice research news. Um, we'll simply use these jump links to get to the very bottom of the screen. Um, let me get over here. I'm going to go ahead and jump down. Um, <clears throat> And this should actually take us uh, slightly lower. Well, um, what I'm going to do is simply open up this page because this here now will show you the different products that we do have available. And notice right here on the page, um, you'll see uh, 
bullseye brief is available. Now we do have the prices, the monthly subscription prices are included, but notice here there's also a free trial period that's available. Um, it is a 30-day free trial so that you can access the information today if you'd like to find out more about bullseye brief. By the way, simply click through this uh, <clears throat> Uh, the logo here, and I think that's not going because I already do have it opened up on our site. Notice that by going through, um, simply clicking on that logo, it will take you to a page uh, where you can read more about Bullseye Brief, even get a sample report, and you, um, access to the Bullseye Brief website as well. So did want to show you where you could find some more. So with that, let me move this page back over. And by the way, Bullseye Brief has been integrated into the Trader Workstation. So it's easily accessible from your analytical tools right at the top of your screen. All right, Adam, um, I see some questions have come up. Do you want to take it take back over? I would love to. And, and Cynthia, thank you so much. Um, so. Uh, from uh, Ignacio, uh, thank you for your question, Ignacio. Um, uh, he comments that yes, the macro data and corporate earnings uh, uh, look solid, but um, uh, that in previous bull markets we've had pullbacks of five to ten percent, sometimes even fifteen percent. And um, this year, by contrast, we've only had uh, little pullbacks along the way of, of two to three percent. Um, does this um, sort of implied complacency or the fact that we haven't been down more than 3%, um, does this concern me? Um, I hear you, Ignacio. Yes, it does a little bit because um, just as we know from looking at data, uh, markets are never a straight line. As a matter of fact, I commented about a month ago in my uh, newsletter that um, uh, some of my names um, and I tend to look at, you know, special situation type stuff. You know, I'm not just, you know, generically buying a Procter & Gamble. Um, Sometimes I'll go into a big name, you know, a Facebook uh, on the fake news scandal because it, it was too cheap to ignore. But um, um, but I, I commented that I think the market in general, um, starting about a month ago, was just becoming more vulnerable to little pullbacks. And I argued for um, uh, lightening up on names that had hit my target. Um, so several of my names have been very fortunate. Um, I've had a couple of doubles and a couple of triples, not all. But um, I, and I was thinking, hey, this is great. Maybe I ought to just raise my target. And then I sort of stopped and I thought to myself, no, um, it hit my target. Sell half the position. So I've been doing a lot more of that recently. Um, there are all these crazy bugaboos um, out there right now. And even you know what's happening at the General Assembly in the United Nations today. Um, um, you know, and, and all the talk about uh, North Korea, yeah, it's a little scary. Um, all that stuff is out of left field. You can never really hedge against crazy events like that, but um, I think at any, at any moment we're probably vulnerable to uh, some sort of little pullback. I'm going to call it 5% off something crazy. You could get more than that, but I will also tell you that that is an opportunity to come back in and do some buying because when we have, um, the, again, the two E's, uh, earnings growth of 10% uh, and full employment, in other words, the highest percentage of Americans working in 16 years, earnings and employment, that is a very powerful tonic for stocks. And with rates still as low as they are, you're not getting returns in the bond market, the stock market, the U.S. stock market in particular, is where you have growth and stability. So, um, yeah, we are certainly vulnerable to a 5% pullback, maybe 10, who knows. But um, that's why you always want to have a list of names to buy. That's why I publish them on Bullseye. I'll be doing my quarter end review and, and what to have on your shopping list. That comes out at the end of the quarter. Um, and for any names that have hit your target, um, not just because you've made a lot, but if they've actually hit the target that you set when you decided to buy that name, lighten up. So um, that was a good question. I probably, I probably spent too much time answering that one, Cynthia, but we covered some ground there. Um, Let's see, uh, from Alan, thank you, Alan, uh, talking about um, China and that one particular chart that went back to the year one, um, where uh, he was thinking that, um, is China really that big, 18% uh, of uh, GDP versus 15% uh, uh, for the U.S.? So, Alan, um, measuring GDP is always a little tricky because um, different countries do it differently. Some measure quarterly change, some yearly change. Um, in some cases, there's even a lag. Um, like some will not report GDP until um, 
uh, like nine months into the next year. So uh, it's, it's a little bit of a moving target and a bit of an estimate like all of economics. But those are, um, uh, those numbers are, are close. I mean, the fact is the U.S. has uh, the largest share of, of, of the U.S. economy. Um, it is the world's largest economy, uh, if you just look by countries. Um, uh, China is uh, the second. Uh, it overtook Japan, which is now number three. Uh, Germany is number four. Curiously, if you were to add the entire EU together, it would actually be um, on par or potentially, depending upon how you want to measure it, slightly larger than the U.S. But again, if we're just going country by country, U.S. number one, China number two, Japan number three, um, Germany number four, that's the, uh, the latest data, that's IMF data, and it's pretty good. It's pretty well scrubbed. So thank you for, for asking um, about that issue. Um, and uh, let's see, from, uh, from Nats, thank you, Nat. Um, um, uh, the question is, what about bonds? Should we stay out of bonds? Yeah, I'll tell you right now, um, personally, I do not like bonds. Uh, when bonds went to 2%, the 10-year went to 2% about a month ago, you may recall, on the first of the angst um, moves on North Korea, I thought that was absurd, and I had told people to uh, short the TLT, uh, which is effectively the ETF if you're not a bond futures trading person. It's, it's a much easier way for stock investors to play bonds. Short the TLT. Um, I think, uh, again, this is me speaking, uh, we go to uh, 3% before we go to 2%. Uh, 2% is uh, angst, it's fear, it's, um, uh, you know, it's like Bitcoin. The world is ending. Um, it's not ending. Uh, we have the two E's, earnings and employment. Um, the Fed is raising rates. It's now going to start scaling back the size of the balance sheet. Um, and I think we have the world coming together to deal with North Korea, not in an emotional way, in spite of, you know, some of the headlines from uh, the president at the UN, but uh, in a logical, responsible way. I think all of that argues for uh, markets uh, moving in um, uh, in a positive direction, and as that happens, we you know get um, the balance sheet back to normal. I think that makes uh, a case for um, bond yields moving lower. Again, they're at about 225 right now, and I would bet on a move to 3% before I bet on a move to 2%. Um, so that's uh, my response. To about it. Cynthia, do you see any uh, other questions as we scroll through here? Well, You're better with all this technology stuff than I am. I see the, uh, the questions, and also, Kizraj, uh, thank you for your comments there about a regular viewer of Bloomberg. I always enjoyed your programming, and now oh. you see where, you've <laughs> where you have resurfaced. And oh, thank very you, pleased to have you with us, and thank you, Kizraj. And I want to thank all of you for attending today's session, um, especially Adam for sharing your insights oh, on, you. on the Fed and what uh, movements to look out for. So with that, we are going to conclude our event. I do want to remind everyone that we have been recording today, and you'll each get a direct link to the recorded playback if you want to come back and review the concepts that Adam has gone through in today's session. By the way, if you'd like a copy of the slides of the charts that Adam's been using today as well, they will be available, and I'll include a link to today's webinar notes in the um, follow-up messages I'll send out shortly. So watch your inbox for that information. By the way, we'll also be posting this to the Interactive Broker website where you can find not only today's presentation, but any of our archived events. Simply go underneath the education menu, you'll find a webinar section um, where you can view either our upcoming events, our live sessions that are about to happen, or those that we have recorded in the past. They're available on demand as well. So with that, uh, once again, thank you all for your participation here today. Have a great rest of your day, and everyone, do remember to please trade smart. Thanks all. Have a great one.